Okay, firstly, my apologies. I can't stay with you today. I have certain religious rights to attend in Cardiff before we retain the Six Nations Championship, all right? Um, my debenture seats are waiting for me. Um, what I want to do is to, something that is going to be maybe controversial, I want to challenge the idea that software development is primarily a manufacturing process. And I'm going to argue that we're at severe danger of taking too much from manufacturing and not enough from service. Um, particularly, I'm going to really make a statement that the Agile Manifesto is a yes but manifesto rather than a yes it's always true manifesto. Our users sometimes are wrong. Yeah, and we need to start to realize that, and they may or may not understand what's capable. So what I want to do is to build some theory, theory around that, and then talk about two sets of practices. One is how you do parallel safe-to-fail experiments rather than doing one thing many times. Uh, and that's actually a very important switch. With higher levels of uncertainty, I can't afford the time to do one thing many times until I get it right. I have to do parallel things many times, and there are certain rules or principles around that that come from complexity theory. And then also I want to talk about new work we're doing on a co-evolutionary approach to understanding user requirements and technology capability. Not a linear process, but a co-evolutionary one, and I'll explain that later. So that's kind of like the plan. Um, I like this quote from Mark Twain because it actually is where strategic surprise comes from. It doesn't matter whether it's counter-terrorism or software development. The thing which kills you are the things you take for granted. Yep. So kind of like just hold that because that's going to be important as we go downstream. Now I'm preparing for this talk and for a article or book chapter I have to write for LSS. I went back to some of the material and there's a lot of good stuff around Lean. Um, like most things which people produce popular books for which go around the market, um, they all contain some beautiful platitudes. Um, I've done a lot of work on this. If you look at corporate mission statements, anybody got corporate mission statements or value statements? Um, you, people just rejig the same group of platitudes in different ways at different times. And then they say they've got a revolutionary method because they're going to put customers first or put fast flow in place. All right? Well, if you go back, you can find that in virtually every management method which has ever been produced. So let's kind of like just get a little bit real about this. The fundamental principle of lean as it stands in manufacturing is fast flow and elimination of waste. Now, I'll come back to the waste issue in a minute, all right? Because there's ideological aspects of that we need to worry about. And now we've got this move from Denning's original plan, do, study, act, to build, measure, lean, learn, or whatever. And again, all of those are cute concepts, but I want to argue in a minute they're linear. The idea is you do something, you learn from it, you move on, you do it again, you do it again. We haven't got the granularity right. And of course, you know, we then get more advanced techniques. We get things like DSX from medicine. Um, they compare it with Dr. House. I actually think it's more Bertie Wooster. Um, and that's actually a positive statement because if you know your Woodhouse, you know that actually that's how Bertie Wooster works, all right? It's a series of experiments. Some of them work, some don't. But again, we got that body of, of knowledge. And finally, we end up with them goddamn cards. Sorry about this. <laughs> I've been to a lot of organizations around the world, and they proudly take me to this big wall with lots of cards on it and say, boy, are we agile, all right? And the answer is, yeah, you've got some cute cards on the wall, right? Let's, let's move on from that. Yeah, that's going to be valuable. But by the time it gets into the cards, it's already formed. And again, that's going to be a key point to make. By the time you get it to the cards, and cards are a legitimate approach, the requirement has now been defined in some way, and that may or may not be right. It depends where you are in the cycle um, of development. So some issues that I have with all of this. First of all, any association of lean with Six Stigma, and I refuse to call it anything else, <laughs> is a fundamental error. I mean, Six Stigma is business process re-engineering where the worst aspects of American Bible Belt fundamentalism have added onto it for good measure. I mean, it's a cult, and the high priests of the cult have different colored belts to indicate their status in the cult. If they get a black belt, they're exempt from doing any real work because their job is now to enforce cult discipline on the people who are. Right? Uh, if you don't believe me, check the 3M case and any other case. It, Six Sigma destroys the capacity of a firm to innovate. Okay? Lean is about eliminating the waste that Six Sigma creates. Putting them two together is a fundamental flaw. Okay? Over-rigid approaches to manufacturing over measurement, which I'll come to an end in issue. 
Second thing is the granularity. By the time feed, things feed into sprints or feed into Kanban or whatever particular method you want to use, the granularity, to my mind, is too big for flexibility. Yet the only flexibility now is to change the thing once you've been through a process. And I, I'm going to argue in a minute, you've got the granularity is just too coarse when it goes into software requirement. And that effectively goes against some of the spirits behind Agile, though it's appropriate in some cases. Then the linearity point, I've made this, I'll repeat it. The fact that you draw a linear process as a circle doesn't make it any less linear. It's still a linear process. In order to make it non-linear, you have to have faster cycle times and parallelism. And I mean really fast cycle times, and they need to take place outside the context of the sprint in the user community and the technology capability, not just within the sprint. That's certainly in the early stages of development. Um, whole issue of transparency or disintermediation. Again, transparency can be good or bad. Transparency can actually prevent people innovating at times. This is not an either transparency is good, non-transparency is bad. Sometimes you have to hide things. All right? But if you don't hide things, people will look at them and they'll be killed. All right? And disintermediation, the visibility to senior decision makers is actually an aspect of that. So again, we need to be careful on transparency. I'll talk about sandboxes later, where you create protected spaces where people can't see what's going on, because sometimes that's actually essential. Now, again, you get in a general sense here and arguing against anything which says this is good and that is bad, and saying this is good in that context, but it's bad in that context. Now, and that's something we'll build on. Um, Lack of coevolution. Coevolution is a concept from biology. It means as one thing interacts with another thing, patterns form from the interaction. And once the pattern's formed, you can never go backwards. With coevolution comes the concept of irreversibility. Anybody got teenage children? Right, you know about coevolution. All right, once a pattern's formed, you can't go backwards. The same is true in a pattern of user understanding of IT capability. Patterns formed, you can't go backwards. You're always dealing from where you are in a complex evolutionary process. You effectively don't get a greenfield site. And the greenfield assumption is far too common in software development. It assumes we can start from scratch or we can start with the user community from scratch. You, know, you don't need to worry about all those IT failures before, guys, because we've all been on agile courses. And we've gone a two-day course and filled out a multi-choice questionnaire. So now we're called masters. So everything will now be fine. Right? They kind of like have been there before and they know about it. Right? So kind of like, you know, realize we're never dealing with a greenfield site. We're moving forward. <coughs> Engagement of users. Again, my observation of this, whether it's Kanban, Scrum, or whatever, is users are still put into little boxes. They have a role, but they're boxes at the start and end of a process. They may be given authority within that, but also there's one user representative. You're not dealing with mass numbers of users. There's all sorts of problems on here in that you've over-constrained the user engagement at an early stage of the process. Now, at a later stage of the process, fine, but I'm going to argue a very different approach early on. And finally, we can't like, forget about technology capability. There's an old adage, and I've been in IT from the days when I was taught in school that if I learned how to use a punch card machine, I would have a job for life. And I still believe that people who grew up programming on you know, punch cards actually have proper discipline in design. You know, compile error card too, you learn to design properly, right? But that's a, an old-fashioned prejudice. But fundamentally, users generally don't know what they want until they get it, and then they want something different. And that's been an adage for many decades. Technology has capabilities that users aren't aware of. Users only really know what they don't like about what they currently got and what they happen to have seen when they were looking over somebody's shoulder the other day. Yeah, the idea that there's this perfect knowledge which can be fed into a process underpins far too much of software development because software is a co-evolutionary service, not a manufacturing capability. In a manufacturing capability, you know what you want to produce. Right? That's a, that's, and software never starts there. The trouble is the current methods actually assume that's a starting point and we need to change that. It's not quite finally, I just realized I've got another one, um, which is fundamentally the scanning range of current requirements capture is very dangerous. Just to give you some basic cog science facts, if somebody conducts more than two interviews, 
their brain forms a subconscious hypothesis and they only pay attention to things that match that hypothesis thereafter. Systems analysts pay attention. All right? One of the things about the scanning range, if we don't increase the diversity of scanning range, multiple observers, multiple agents, what we call human sensor networks, which I'll come back to later, then you're always going to get deep early base pattern entrainment. And part of my brief here, to be honest, is to move analysts from capture to interpretation. Because actually having systems analysts at the capture phase means you limit what you need to know and you limit the granularity and all sorts of other things. And I'll talk about a new method for that in a minute. And Hugh, if you don't know about Gaping Void cartoons, subscribe to the Gaping Void web website. If it wasn't for this and Dilbert every day, I would probably go insane, right? You know, when these comes. The key place on that phrase is that we need to get people to where they need to be. And I mean need to be. And that may not be where they want to be. Yeah, and technology is actually one of the key ways in a modern organization by which we actually achieve that shift. Okay, how many people know about complexity theory? Uh, okay, right, we've got a big in our audience. Okay. It's normally posed like this. You know, we've either got, you know, the sea of chaos or the nice little ship of order. And I hate to tell you this, but IT people are really into this, right? Um, yeah, their desks and their workspace may be totally messy, but users are expected to be tidy, constructive, and do things in proper order, right? User requirements documents are designed so that users sign things they can't understand, but we can hold them accountable for later. And that ain't changed much with Scrum. No? Except you know, let one person really know about it. Um, now, there is actually a third type of system, a complex adaptive system. Now, there are various definitions of this. I use the constraint-based definition. So if you have a high level of constraint, a system is ordered. Yeah, that means you get repeating relationships between cause and effect. The same thing will happen again the same way twice. On the other hand, if there are no constraints, and there are various ways in this world, this is why I'm using it, it's the system is totally random, there are no constraints, and that's actually quite cute because that's where things like wisdom of crowd mathematics come into play. You know about wisdom of crowds? Okay, you know, I'll give you my favorite example is an American submarine grounded off the coast of Portugal. Uh, it didn't sink, I was corrected on that by an admiral in Norfolk Navy Base, he pointed out submarines are meant to sink. <laughs> You know, if they go down and don't come up again, that's called grounding, and I learned from that, if anybody's got three stars on their shoulder, let them humiliate you in the first three minutes, then there's a chance they'll listen to you thereafter, all right? And that applies to many leaders. Um, what they then got is groups of experts around the world to estimate where the submarine are grounded. They didn't let them talk with each other, that's key. None of them got it right, but the average of all the expert positions was six meters away from the submarine. All right, now there are cognitive science and mathematical reasons why that works. And when I come back to human sensor networks, you'll see how this comes into play, building large networks of humans who can make judgments in isolation from each other without knowledge of what the other person do is one of the ways we actually create evidence base, an evidence base for decisions under uncertainty. And that's a big area where we're working now with governments. With one government, for example, we're building a network of 10,000 citizens who will keep daily diaries of what it means to be whatever they are and that sense and that actual data will replace market research and polling, but it also creates a sense in that we can trigger to ask questions. And again, nobody would have thought of that till technology came along. Users couldn't say they needed that, but technology makes something possible which previously nobody had seen. Now, that's the sort of co-evolutionary point I want to emphasize. Now, there's a third type of system, a complex adaptive system, and this is one where the system is modified constantly as the agents act with it. So the system provides some constraint, but the agents modify the system as they go through. So the two co-evolve, that word again. That makes it inherently uncertain. Now there are various ways of explaining this. If you want the children's party story, I've performed it too much this week, so you'll have to go and look it up on the web. The other one I use a lot is to think about a group of ring magnets around a table. Yeah, electromagnets. And I can alter the polarity and strength of some of them. Some of them people I know can alter, and some of them are changing, but I don't know whether anybody's in control or not. Everybody got the picture? And in the middle of the table, which has a high coefficient of resistance, in case anybody wants to get pedantic with me, right, this is a metaphor, there are iron ball bearings. If all of the magnets stay with the same polarity and the same strength, I can predict the behavior of the ball bearings, they'll be static. 
If one of the magnets changed, I can predict the behavior. But of course, when they all change, I can't. And that's actually a key distinction between complexity thinking and systems thinking, and don't let anybody let, tell you they're the same. In systems thinking, people are constantly calling about drivers. In complexity, we talk about modulators. You actually, if I change this magnet now, it will produce that effect. If I change it in a minute's time, it will produce a different effect. So I haven't got anything which can count as a driver. I haven't got linear causality. What I've actually got is things which modulate the system behavior, but not in a predictable way. And the system is dispositional, not causal. I can say it's disposed to evolve in these sort of directions. It's not to disp disposed to evolve in these. But I can't say this happened because of that, other than with the benefit of hindsight. And that makes complexity a fascinating field, because it's the reality of most human systems. But we tend to try and assume they're ordered to a different degree. Right? So that's kind of like where complexity comes from. And the key thing to understand about complexity is you can't get rid of it, you have to absorb it. Anybody who tries to remove it, by definition, removes things from the scanning range, and therefore they end up with strategic surprise or operational surprise or whatever. Yep. Now from that, and I'm not going to go into detail, the Canavian framework, which is reasonably well known, splits order into two, simple and complicated. In simple order, there are repeating relationships between cause and effect, which are self-evident to any reasonable person, so I can apply best practice. If it's complicated, there are repeating relationships between cause and effect, it's still ordered, but they're not self-evident, so I have to do analysis or bring in experts to make the choice. And therefore, I can apply good practice, which means there are variations in what you do based on your expertise. You're not into one single way of doing things. The big mistake on the way by Six Sigma implementation is they assume complicated is simple. Actually, they also assume complex is simple. That's really bad, but the, the, the predictive one is Complicated is not the same thing as simple. It's not self-evident, people. You try and impose one way of doing things. The real experts will know there are variations. You'll lose credibility, and things will go underground. If you don't know it, the density of informal networks is directly proportional to the level of perceived bureaucracy. So as the bureaucracy increases, the informal networks increase to make the system work despite itself, which is actually why that bit at the bottom is drawn as a failure. If you treat a complex system as if it's simple, people will make the system work, which means failure will be disguised, so when failure happens, it's catastrophic. We then get complexity and chaos. Complexity, that's the magnets. The only way to understand the complex system is by interacting with it. Remember the magnets again? It's only when you change magnets in combination you can see a system effect. So the fundamental shift is from fail-safe design to safe-to-fail experimentation. On the right-hand side of the model, you can design something. On the left-hand side of the model, you're into an evolutionary experimental model in which the only way to understand it is by engagement, and by engagement in parallel with contradictory experiments. That, that contradictory element is a key part of it. So that's the Canavian framework. It also has a central domain, which people forget, called disorder which is a domain of not knowing which of the other systems you're in, which is a bad place to be, because then you'll go with whatever you feel most comfortable with, right? and that's bad. And as I said earlier, you've got the catastrophic failure down there, and that's described in that Harvard article. Right? Now, I'm not going to go into more detail on that, but that's available if you want it. What I am going to finish up with is a, what's called a domain model for complexity, because I'm going to argue there are different types of complexity where we have different requirements and that will allow us to determine the sort of Kanban scrum type issues. Just to make it clear though, Kinevin is fundamentally about dynamics or movement, not statics. I've got fed up of people who say, my scrum technique is complex, Kanban is complicated, therefore I am better. All right, and it's kind of, yeah, and then the really ones, well, I'm chaotic, yeah, I, I, I'm a magician, I manage chaos, yeah. Now this is total crap, right? <laughs> fundamentally, any technique in a human system is designed to make complex things complicated. Complexity is about exploration. Complicated is about exploitation. So properly understood, Scrum is about shifting things across that boundary. And actually, its starting point is on the boundary, not really deep into complexity anyway. Yet Kanban, I would argue, is always complicated. 
right? Because by the time you got there, you've got structure, you've got definition, you've got constraint, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah? We actually want things to be complicated because then we can get scalability, repeatability, all those sort of good things. Complex is hugely valuable for exploration. It's where we start, but it's not an end state. It's a starting point in software design. <coughs> And of course, if you don't manage that constant flow between those two, you know, relaxing constraints so you open up new possibility, closing them down so you can exploit them, you may occasionally need to do a drastic reset, what we call a shallow dive into chaos, break the constraints completely for a period to allow something to emerge, and only a very small amount of stuff in Kinevin drops down into that space. Things go there to die. Yeah. Um, now, they may take 20 years to die and have high utility while they're there, but they never change. No? So the key thing is to maintain that dynamic, and that's what Kinevin is about. It's not a crude categorization technique. It's a way of understanding flow, which is why a lot of lean people are taking it, because it manages that flow, but says different words in different spaces. And I'm pleased to say that of recent times, Gartner have recognized that. Uh, that's a Gartner report prediction. And the interesting thing we're finding about the Kinevin framework now is we can use the same model for IT operations as we use for core corporate strategy. So the ability to use the same framework defined in subtly different ways allows a more effective communication between strategy and operations. And that's a whole lecture in its own right, so I'm not going to go there, but I just flag it up for the moment. Now, in a complex world, as I said, the key thing is dealing with what I call messy coherence. And for that, I've given you the spider's web metaphor. Um, you can see there was a pattern there, but the pattern isn't perfect. And that's where most of us live. Uh, you all may know somebody whose desk is always immaculate, neat and tidy. Everything is lined up. Everything is filed away with proper colored folders, or their Kanban board has proper color coding, and it's always perfect. Everybody knows somebody like that? You need one person like that on your team, but you do not want your children ever to marry them. <laughs> Most of us live in a state of what I call messy coherence. So things degenerate into mess, we get fed up, we tidy it up, then it degenerates into mess again. And that's actually very sensible. Because the structure I create yesterday is no longer valid in a week's time. So that cycle between mess and structure is key. Now, my argument for years is that's what object orientation was really about. It was allowing messily coherent software development rather than just repeatability. Now, to my mind, applications should emerge from the interaction of objects with users. I, applications should not be designed. They should be an emergent property of things developing in the right way because that gives you resilience and dynamic flexibility. Now, and I think, you know, if I'm really being technical about this, I'd say we need to start to treat people as objects too. Right? I mean, objects in the object design sense, because actually then we can design and architect decent systems, whereas at the moment we tend to take this linear separation type approach, which I think is dangerous. Either way, for complex design, and now start to think about this, since you're going to run a sprint, or you're going to run a, a prototype, or whatever you want to call it, whether it's DSDM or Scrum or whatever, there are some key rules on what you do if you're dealing with a high level of complexity. Right? The first one is that each experiment should be coherent. You don't do something just because somebody thinks it would be a good idea. There's got to be some rationale to it. Right? Now I should say complexity theory gives you a huge amount of conflict resolution capability because actually strategic or operational conflict always happens in the complex domain because the evidence will support multiple hypotheses. And the answer is you can't work out in advance what's right or wrong. So one of the ways you reduce conflict is anybody with a coherent hypothesis runs a safe to fail experiment. You stop trying to decide who's right. If it's coherent, you're going to run an experiment. Right? But the test for coherence is key. For those of you who know it, we have a technique called ritual descent, which actually at a very short level can hugely improve coherence. It involves people presenting ideas to audiences and not being allowed to reply while well, their ideas are torn apart. Yep. And you do it in ritual in parallel, and you can look that up if you want. Second thing is they must be safe to fail. If anybody wants, we actually have forms for these to make sure people follow it. 
I was doing some stuff with Visa on this the other day, but fundamentally, safe to fail means if it doesn't work, we can recover. All right? You don't do any experiment where you haven't worked out in advance what are the early signs of failure, what are the early signs of success, what are the actually dampening strategies if it fails, what are the amplification strategies if it succeeds. If you can't put those four boxes with a coherent argument, it's not safe to fail. Complexity requires more management discipline rather than less in that sense. Then, they need to be tangible. They need to be small, finely grained, tangible things. Right? Now, that's actually, people get too abstract about complexity at times, including me, but fundamentally, an experiment has to be finely grained, small, tangible, understandable. And then some of them, let's put these up, some of them need to be oblique. There's a wonderful book by a British economist called Obliquity, which I recommend. Trying to solve another problem related to the problem you've really got often is more effective. Yeah, so actually doing something slightly different in a different field will often spin off a solution in the field you're trying to work out if it's particularly complex. Secondly, naive process approaches work. In my time, I've used Lutheran liturgical design specialists to manage knowledge transfer in operating theatres in a hospital in Bellingham. Because a liturgical design specialist understands how to compress complex ideas into a memorable form. I put biology professors into engineering departments. Because biology professors know about structures that engineers don't even know. So naivety doesn't mean stupid, it means somebody with a completely different knowledge base. Yeah, in Holiday Inns, Joe Jenner and I put anthropologists into Holiday Inns worldwide. Not anthropologists who study business, but generally naive ones who just come from Papua New Guinea. The report they wrote on mating rituals in the kitchen was fascinating. <laughs> but we learned a huge amount about the real structure of the organization from a completely different perspective. Start to get the principle? Some of your experiments need to be naive, and you also need a few high-risk ones. The great thing about a portfolio approach is senior managers understand portfolios, and they understand that some high-risk things will produce a high return. So actually creating a portfolio of safe-to-fail experiments gives you more license to experiment because you're actually matching a pattern that they already understand. And finally, some of them must contradict. Okay, so that's kind of like some basic rules. And my argument is you make actually, for example, sprints by running parallel sprints. You're actually handling complexity far more than by doing one thing and repeating it and trying to get it right. But the granularity is key. And of course, when things go wrong, you've got to be careful about not adopting that approach. Um, I should say that we really hope the English forwards adopt that approach this afternoon, but, you know, that's another matter. Okay, two key words that I want you to understand. One is acceptation. I got really irritated. I saw this on somebody's blog the other day without acknowledgement, but never mind. Anybody know where this came from? Okay, it's Bangkok during the floods. Somebody actually realized their car was at threat. They happened to have a big plastic bag in the garage, so they drove the car into the plastic bag, sealed the end. Their car survived. All right, now everybody in Bangkok has got a big specially designed plastic bag in their garage. That's called acceptation. Yeah, adaptation is something develops for a specific function. That's what every software development process I ever see does. Acceptation means something developed for one thing gets used for something else instead, which proves more useful. Right? So somebody notices when they're maintaining a magneto in 1943 that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket, we get microwave ovens. We need to design software for acceptation. Uh, that means introducing some general, some experimental capabilities which will allow that sort of process. And then we get the coherence argument with the spider's web. Um, coherence allows me to say, for example, that evolutionary theory is coherent even though it's wrong, whereas creationism is incoherent, so it's going in the wrong direction. I do like that picture, right? I like showing it in the States, particularly. <laughs> but fundamentally, yeah, that's the point about coherence. You can say some directions are wrong without having to say these directions are right. It's kind of like a halfway house. All right, so the coherence test is important for strategy. Okay, so let's talk about how we enable that in user requirements. Now, 
One of the key things is to work with silos, not against them. Anybody got a problem with silo-based thinking? Yeah, okay, it's a common one, all right? I actually traced this back. The first recorded example I have of it is Solon, the tyrant of Athens, right? So people have been complaining about silos for thousands of years. So come on, let's just work out it ain't going to change. Complexity is about pragmatism, not idealism. We don't define an ideal future state and try and close the gap. We work with where we are. So complexity, you don't say good programmers have these competences, or worse still, you never ever use Myers-Briggs because it has no basis whatsoever in science. I once actually proved astrology was more successful in predicting the future than Myers-Briggs in IBM, but the HR suppressed the report, but never mind. Right? <laughs> um, fundamentally, what we're trying to do here is to recognize reality. You don't say it would be nice if everybody were like this. You say people are like this, now how are we going to change it? Right, you work with the evolutionary potential of the present rather than an idealized future state. Okay, so if you've got silos, work with them. Don't try and break them down. You won't do it. Second thing, distributed ethnography. This is where people become their own ethnographers. Uh, we did work, and we're about to do work in Columbus, in Colombia, down in Latin America, where we'll end up over six cities in, from Bogota onwards, pulling in thousands of street narratives every day with kids acting as their own ethnographers so we can scale the capture. Because we're looking to identify the patterns through which people will effectively break society so the drug balance can get re-entry. Now, there's some very significant projects going on. We've done several of these. But the principle is you want, and let's take it back to users, you want users to be their own analysts rather than bringing in the expert. Now, and that's what distributed ethnography means because it allows you to go further and faster. Modularity is key. Yeah, and again, you can read by an author on this, on the evolution of technology. Uh, a magneto can accept. The parts of a magneto aren't modular enough to accept. Yeah, so getting the modularity right is key, and that will vary according to circumstances. So we need to do that. And then, <coughs> human metadata. Now, one of the things the IT community have got to realize is that Chomsky's theories of language were disproved 30 years ago. Sorry about that, all right? But it means there are no deep structures in language. There is no grammar gene. It means all that clever stuff you do with sentiment analysis is really useful, but it's bounded. Language can change meaning in seconds, and therefore what becomes key is you put a human metadata layer above the top, and this is the stuff we pioneered and patented, is how do you actually do that? So at a very simple level, what we're now starting to do is go and gather stories from users. This isn't done by sending analysts out, it's by giving a population of users iOS devices to tell a story, take a picture, record something, every time something doesn't work, every time they get frustrated, every time they think of something. You remember the granularity point I made earlier? And then they self-interpret that narrative. <laughs> because what you want to do is mass continuous capture rather than staccato capture around a specific system development. Because that will also give you downstream monitoring and measurement of system effectiveness. And of course, in parallel with that, I can do the same sort of thing with technology. So what I can now start to do is to say everybody, you know, you've got loads of people in IT, you've got people outside, you do the same thing. Every time you see a cute example of an app which might be useful in the company, make a note of it, write a story, index it. Don't do this on the basis that you've got a specific requirement, but just do it continuously. And you all have that. You, know, you suddenly remember something you saw five years ago which is now relevant. Well, it would be rather nice if you captured more of those things five years ago so they could be discovered by other people now. Right? So you're moving into continuous capture. The approach we adopt to human metadata is various, but principally it involves people configuring their story into a triad. The point about a triangle is it increases the cognitive load on the brain. Just answering a Likard scale doesn't. So I'll give you an example. Everybody done an employee satisfaction survey? You know that question, do your managers consult you on a regular basis, scale of 1 to 10? I used to phone up HR who didn't like me, as you probably gathered already, all right, for various <laughs> reasons, and say, which manager? Because I've got five, plus the three I take business direction from. Right? 
And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, and sometimes they should and sometimes they shouldn't, so how am I meant to answer this? And they said, average your experience over the year, at which point I used to make very sarcastic comments about their ability to understand research. The narrative approach is very different. You say to somebody, what's the story you tell about this organization to your best friend if they were offered a job? You root it in something deeply contextual. Then you say, in this story, context, where does a leadership behavior balance between altruism, analytics, and assertiveness? All of which are valuable. So there's no indication of what the right answer is. Right? Same thing with user requirements capture. By moving things into an ambiguous structure, you discover things you didn't expect. You're dealing with ambiguous data, you need ambiguous metadata structures, and there's various ways of doing that. What we can then do, and this gets exciting, is if I've got IT people continuously capturing material about technology capabilities and users doing continuous capture, all with the same metadata structures, guess what I can do? I can mash them up. And I can end up with different clusters. And some of those clusters will effectively become new systems. Where I can put technology together from different silos from people's experience over time with user stories about needs in the present. And then I'll also find some other clusters. I'll find clusters where in effect, yeah, I've got user questions or user ideas where I've got no technology. Well, that actually indicates there's a whole area of what users are doing that I've got no idea what I'm doing about. And the other area, fairly obviously, and we've seen this several times in the tests, is clusters of technology capability which have no match whatsoever with user stories. Which actually means the investment may be wrong. Okay? Now, say, I said it off you, so that's a different approach. Because I then leave the system in place continuously. So as clusters form, I develop probes. You know, I run sprints, I develop prototypes. If they work, the stories users tell should change. So I'm moving now into a continuous flow at the user requirements level, not just continuous flow in production. And that's where you genuinely make software into a lean type process. Now, I haven't got time to go through this now because I need to finish because I have to get a train for certain important matters aside from the flags being sent to me. So I'll leave that one out. But I thought I'd finish with this. Goodhart's law. Any statistical instrument used for policy loses all value. Strathen's variation of that is any measure which becomes a target ceases to be a measure. Because now you get what you measure, not what you actually wanted to achieve. And even worse than that, for a new scientist, yeah, I'll give you the full reference, any extrinsic reward destroys intrinsic motivation. And that's not controversial, that's just fact. Extrinsic reward destroys intrinsic motivation. Think back to what I talked about a minute ago. If your target is to modify the stories told by users, that measures success without you defining in advance what success has to be. And that's the switch from outcome-based targets to impact-based measurement. And that's critical because that allows very fast cycle time development. And we need to realize that for human systems, whether we see the data, whether we pay attention to the data, whether we will act on the data are three separate processes. Traditional decision theory, and this is where I have my thesis and everything, assumes if you put the right information in front of the right people at the right time and they have the right competences and the right training, they will make the right decisions. Well, they will if they're autistic. And just to worry you this, there's a high degree of partial autism in computer science departments in universities. Yeah, and economics, so you're in, in bad company, if I may say so, at that point, right? Yeah. Um, fundamentally, whether I see the data, whether I pay attention to the data, whether I act on it, are separate processes, and design has to take that into account. By increasing parallelism, by increasing flow, by reducing the granularity, you actually allow systems which can genuinely evolve, which is a completely different metaphor from a manufacturing one. Start to think of software as part of a complex ecology, not as a closed manufacturing process. Thank you very much for your time.
Yeah. Um, so, very interesting with your point about uh, things being too well defined before they come into being worked on. I just wondered if you had any um, interest or opinions on GOICO EdSec's workaround specification by example. I think it gets granularity wrong. Okay. So what I would want is a cluster of user stories with a cluster of technology capabilities, and then my brain can do something which is called conceptual blending. Okay. And what conceptual blending means is I take those various things plus the current situation and I create something unique from the combination. Okay. So again, I think the granularity issue is the key one. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, over there. You I was one of the three people who set that up in a pub in Cheltenham many years ago. Okay. Now, what do you think of stuff like program, uh, which is business-driven kind of? It's, it's not, I mean, how do how do infrastructure the necessity to blend people from different backgrounds? Because the right view is people only do blend when they have massive problems. I think they, they blend where you put them together. So we have a technique. Let me give you an example on this. Because there's all sorts of people who grasp some of the essence of this. And then they just say, why don't we do this without producing constructive methods? All right? We have a method called social network stimulation. Right? This actually is designed for self-organizing teams, but it's constraint-based self-organization. Too many people in Agile think self-organization means work with people you like. <laughs> yeah, that's called anarchy, and sorry, as a former Catholic Marxist feminist, I don't buy anarchists on religious and political grounds, all right? And there's only one solution to deal with them, all right? Fundamentally, what SMS does is said, if you can self-form a team with no more than seven people, and that's a significant number, and the team members have these characteristics, and you achieve the result, you get that reward. Yeah. So it's, it's task focused. So what we do is we define a menu of intractable problems. Yeah, in IT, this is a 10% of a project which is going to cause 90% of the group. So you say, if you can form a team with a Java swing program, a systems architect, you know, whatever, right? You put the rules in. And with three users with this background and 10 years experience, we put users into the equation. And you can use a prototype. If this panel wants in the final system, then you stay together as a team and you deliver it. If you don't, you go to multiple teams. Now that's actually a different approach to forcing diversity by task-based action, but with constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I've uh, read a lot recently about uh, various takes on um, estimation is equal. What's your opinion? Um, the best project I ever did, which is a project we set up the company in Aero, which was a $1.7 million contract for the government of Singapore I did the estimate on a sheet of paper in half an hour to get the bidding on time. Yeah? And I did it by saying, I've got these people who can do these sort of jobs, and therefore they can achieve these sort of tasks, and I'll build this sort of ambiguity into the specification, and we delivered on time and under budget. I haven't had to redo the thing twice, because of people in the States I won't talk about, yeah. but that's another matter. I think you have to think about what you're doing. I think it's actually easier if you've got the right experience and the right background. And the trouble is, we've got few generalists left in IT these days. The generation who grew up with it, who, you know, they're, they're very small now. But that ability to you actually you know how I, overall I can probably get this sort of thing at that very high level works. The minute you aggregate upwards, you misunderstood complexity. Complex systems are not aggregate, or right, and they're not reductionist. So I think the issue on estimation is actually you estimate differently in the different domains of the so as things move around, you know, once you move it into complicated, you can do aggregative estimating. In complex, you're in time boxes, sprints, parallel experiments, whatever, right? the way you do it. And I think, again, that's that diversity. People are trying to produce one solution to estimating, rather than saying, actually, the old ways work, but we need some new ways on the other side of the phone. Uh, I think um, what they were trying to get around is But you can't, I agree with that, right? Well, that's my point, if it's complex. What you can do, however, you can estimate, you know, with these teams over this time period, somebody's gonna come up with a solution. Right? And then that solution goes into more formal estimating downstream. So I don't think you give up on this, and I think there's a tendency to reject the old structured stuff, when actually it's just that we've tried to make the old structured stuff work in the wrong domains. If we do different things there, we can actually use a lot of that capability. Okay, guys. I have to get a train. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the day, and I really hope I do. Yeah. <laughs>